I'm listening to this uh, this news of uh, John Boehner re- resigning, and it's not quite clear. According to the Washington Times, he's resigning from Congress. Some people are just saying he's resigning as Speaker, which means he'd still be serving in Congress. I know it's a it's it's a big national story. On the other hand, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later this morning because I don't know that there's any immediate impact in southern Idaho with the news that this is coming down. And it's it's not unexpected because he's being challenged by many people in his own party, and it was likely that he was facing what you'd call a no-confidence vote and he wasn't going to succeed. I will tell you this. I was uh, I was contacted by Congressman Raul Labrador's office yesterday and Congressman Labrador is going to become a weekly guest on our program talking about various issues. And I think it's because uh, Mr. Labrador is going to be now included in the new House leadership, the new makeup of that when that's finished. Maybe not Speaker, maybe not even Majority Leader, but you could see him as Majority Whip. He could end up moving up to second or third at least in the House of Representatives in Washington. So I just want to pass that along. We'll talk about that a bit later in the program. I do have a lot going on, and, and that's why... I wanted to share a couple of things with you this morning on, on some other topics first before we get back to that. i point out we've got a guest coming up about 9.20 this morning. Her name is Stephanie Clark. She has written a book, a Christian-based book. Think about that for a moment. We don't, we don't hear about that very often anymore, do we? And she's doing a book signing next week at Chick-fil-A, of all places. That shouldn't be a surprise to Christians, though, shouldn't it? Because it might just be the most Christian restaurant chain in, in all of America. She's coming up in the next hour. We've got a lot to talk about, too, as well, about Saeed Abedini. He is the pastor from Boise who is being held in Iran. There's some new developments there, and they're not good. We can get to that a little bit later in the program as well. But I wanted to open up on a couple of other topics related to what's really become the story du jour. That is the daily story here in the uh, the Magic Valley over the last several months. The folks who have been opposed to this refugee resettlement plan in, in, in the area, bringing in hundreds and hundreds of Syrians and maybe not knowing what their backgrounds are, have managed to get released seven pages of documents from the College of Southern Idaho's Refugee Center. A breakdown of where money goes and how it's spent. A lot of it on rent, a lot of it helping people out with other various costs in the community when they're resettled here. Seven pages is, is what's posted on Facebook, and I happened to take a look at that today, but one of the one of the members of the organization that has been battling this says they still are not releasing they still are not releasing the total dollar figures of what it costs but they've got a breakdown right down to the names of people who are getting their rent paid in this community which is why I have not yet posted that i've decided to err on on, on caution i'll let them post that but i, I really don't want people's names up there because i, I don't know that particularly we're t- trying to target anyone in this community and saying, oh, look, they live over here. His name is Joe Smith. Well, they're not, most of the refugees are not named Joe Smith, but you get the idea. I don't really want to put these people in the sights of anyone out there who might think, hey, we'll go settle a few scores personally. And while I realize that's a stretch, there might be, it's a very tiny fraction, but there's a very tiny fraction in this community I might be concerned about in these situations. So I wanted to mention that, opening up the program today, and I also saw this from Jed Babin. Jed Babin is a a former member of the House of Representatives. I believe he comes from Colorado. He's a regular columnist at the Washington Times. Why Europe is losing the refugee war. Now, what's going on in Europe? There are fears that this could be taking place in this country. I think we're all aware of that. He says, It is something less than an invasion, but much more than what peace can accommodate. It is, in short, a significant threat to their national security and their economies. The EU nation's reactions have been erratic and confused, he writes. Then he goes on to say is what is entirely absent from the European debate is the idea of taking steps to stop the human tidal wave by stabilizing the nations from which the refugees flow. Of all all countries that are, are, are stepping in and trying to do that, it's the Russians. And now you've got people in Washington complaining about a Russian presence in Syria. Yet it was three, four years ago that Mr. Putin came to Mr. Obama and uh, as well the English and he said, tell you what, help us out. We'll make sure we get rid of Assad. We'll stabilize the government. And the British and President Obama blew him off. So now he's got boots on the ground, and it looks like he's going to take take out ISIS sometime in the next few months, if not just a few weeks. Well, someone's got to do it, right? For all the, 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 the complaining we do about the Russians, as if somehow the Cold War is still underway, remember Mr. Putin recognizes the Russian Orthodox Church. He's a big supporter of it. He is much opposed to Islamic republics along his southern border. He has had a terrorist problem for over a decade with these people. 
and yet he deals with it with a heavy hand, and he's pretty much eliminated it, the terrorist attacks that were taking place within his own country. There were two major ones. All he simply did was have his people track down all of the terrorists and all of their families, and he had them all killed. And all the other terrorists who were planning attacks said, hmm, gee, I don't know. Sometimes that's what it takes. The U.S. used to do that. We used to have a CIA that would go around and do those things. Some people say, oh, that's not nice. Well, you know what? It saves lives in the long run. Twelve minutes now after 8 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Yesterday the governor was on this program. i got another beef I've got to, uh, I've got to share with you. This is, a, in fact, one of those moments where I, I sometimes will break with a majority of the audience that listens to this program. The governor was on the show with us yesterday, and he said, we need to suspend that refugee program. Now, he didn't say he would eliminate the local refugee center. And you know what? I've got to be honest with you. I'm not in favor of eliminating it either. I have a friend who was, uh, who was uh, from Vietnam. I went to college with him. And his family had supported the United States during the war in, in Southeast Asia. And when the war was over, they had to get out or they were going to have their heads chopped off or shot or drowned or whatever it would be that would, would happen to a great many of these people. And because they had supported us, it was a good idea to bring our allies here and resettle them. And he's an engineer today doing great things in his new homeland. So I'm not totally opposed. But I, I got these reactions from people yesterday who were like, well, yeah, but you know, the governor did this and he did that and he did. And I don't like that he did this. I'll tell you something. Politicians are human beings, too. We're all aware of that, right? Let's just say you're sitting on a street corner, and every day for a couple of years, some guy comes down the street and slaps you aside the head. After a while, you don't really want to be nice to that guy, and you don't want to work with that guy. But after two years, he comes down the street, and, and, and you look at him, and you say to him, I might be able to help you out with a few problems that you have. And you know what you do? You don't reach out and slap him aside the head again. Sometimes... People in the elective office will do things that are in agreement with you. And you know what? You've got to stop saying, yeah, but have you ever thought if you, you tried to support some of these people when they do the right thing once in a while, it might actually, you know, you might draw more hot flies with honey. Hmm? Does that occur to anyone out there? The governor has simply said, and he's following a new line of thought that's coming out of Washington. He has simply said, it's time to step up. And I think this is a. I think it's 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 certainly true. And you know what? If you stop, you suspend the refugee program until you sort out who the good guys are and the bad guys are. It's irrelevant what happens here at the local center. They'll be sitting around twiddling their thumbs. They won't have much to do until that all gets settled and and and, and taken care of. Problem solved, right? So why? sit there and say, yeah, but Governor Otter did this. And back in, you know, 2012 or 2013, he made me mad about this. And this is wrong. The guy just extended the olive branch to you. He is the most powerful man in the state of Idaho. Get with the program, folks. I mean, I, sometimes I wonder where our minds are in all of this. What do you expect? If you want Jesus to run for office, you're going to be waiting around a long time. Because nobody out there is perfect but him at least from a Christian standpoint. Number two, the only candidate that you're going to agree with 100% is yourself. All right, you go out and raise at least the $1 million, probably more you're going to need to win that office so you can make the changes. Number three, I keep hearing the governor could close this program down in the state if he wanted to. People tell me that. Show me the statute. I've been hearing that for a very long time. Well, yeah, but he could do it. All right, show me the statute. Where, where, where is it that in law? Explain that one to me. So he's just done something that is a very bold step, and you want to ignore it. Do you want his help, or do you not want his help? 816, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. It's 52, on our way to 92 today. So we've got another 40 degrees to warm up before it's all over with. This is a Texas representative. He serves in the House of Representatives in Washington by the name of Brian Babin. He was appearing last night on Fox News Channel with Sean Hannity. He is introducing a bill that would actually suspend this refugee program, or migrant program, if you'd like to call it that. James Clapper, the head of the, the, the National Intelligence head, and our State Department have both said the same thing, that ISIS and Al-Qaeda will infiltrate the refugee population. So doesn't that yeah. mean that the risk is there and, and we can't ascertain whether they're a genuine refugee or an ISIS fighter? 
That's exactly right, Sean. <clears throat> There's no way to vet or screen these people uh, coming out of the Middle East. And all we have to do is look at Western Europe and the failures of their refugee uh, program. And then uh, looking at ours, we've already taken 500,000 refugees in the last six years of President Obama's uh, administration. And uh, less than 5% of those have been the most persecuted group of all, and that's Christians. All right. A lot of the Republicans in Washington, in the House and Senate, they control both houses. I realize John Boehner is, an, is a fine example of why we haven't gotten a lot done. But allow them to carry the ball on this one and let President Obama threaten a veto and let President Obama explain why he would take chances with your security. Sometimes you have to look at this from a political standpoint, the real politic in all of this. And this is what they happen to be doing right now, and the governor is on board with that. For a change, cut the man a little slack. You can reach our program today by calling us at 736-0300, 736-0300. In a few minutes, I'm going to share with you some of the comments made this week by the man who should be the Prime Minister of England, a fellow by the name of Nigel Farage. His party managed in the May elections for Parliament to come up with about one-fifth of the vote. But you don't get proportional representation in English Parliament, so they only picked up a couple of seats. On the other hand, much like Winston Churchill in the 1930s, who was warning of disaster for his country in the face of Nazi Germany, and the English people just sat on their hands, and his fellow politicians sat on their hands, Farage, 80 years later, seems to be gaining finally, just like Churchill at the very last minute in the darkest hour, got himself named prime minister. Churchill, by the way, was not elected prime minister until the early 1950s. He just simply was named prime minister by default when Chamberlain's government fell, and then later on lost an election at the end of the war, and then came back a few years later and got himself elected for the very first time outright as prime minister. This guy, Nigel Farage, has been fighting this battle all alone in Europe for many, many years. Similar to the battle we've been fighting over the last several months here, he hasn't got much traction, but he's getting it now, and we'll share with you exactly why. That's coming up in the next segment of the program. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. I do hope you can stick around. We have a lot to cover, but I'm going to devote quite a bit of this first hour to this subject, and then we'll get into the, the Boehner resignation and some of the other things a little later in the show. I think that at least we should acknowledge that something's going on there, and it may soon be happening in the U.S. Senate as well. It would be nice to see uh, Mitch McConnell go as well, wouldn't it? And perhaps we'll finally get some people who have, uh, well, and there's two guys without a pair. I guess we're going to have to find somebody in Washington who can actually stand up and say no for a change. We don't have a lot of people serving in government in this country along the lines of the Englishman Nigel Farage. And he's not actually a member of the British Parliament. He's a member from Britain of the European Union Parliament, which he would actually like to dissolve. He's the leader of the United Kingdom Independent Party, known for short as UKIP. And he has been warning for many, many years about the dangers of a new caliphate establishing itself in Europe. And Europe is faced right now, its civilization across Europe is threatened because of what's going on with these migrants pouring in by the hundreds of thousands. Farage was giving a speech, he was doing a Q&A, in fact, at a theater this week in Essex, that's in, uh, in England, and he says there are some obvious warnings about migrants and refugees. We should take heed, too, in this part of the world. Already we have seen one of the terrorist suspects responsible for the first Tunisian massacre getting off a boat on an Italian beach. Uh, two weeks ago, Five people were stopped in Hungary and found to have jihadist beheading videos on their iPhones. And when David Cameron went to the Lebanon this week and visited the camps, the Lebanese minister that showed him round explained to the Prime Minister and to the press that he needed to understand that about 2% of people in that camp had already been radicalized and were already jihadists. I, uh, I've been making the point for a very long time on this program. All of the people who shout and scream that you're just being insensitive, mean, or racist if you will not support this refugee resettlement program, they have not considered any of the security questions. Or if they have, they really don't care what happens to you. They'll say, well, you know, we've got to do it. 
I've got to lose my head. If it happens, well, I'll be doing the right thing by allowing these people to come here. Well, don't speak for the rest of us. The rest of us feel we need to take care of these issues first before anything happens. And this guy Farage, as I say, at least someone somewhere around the globe has been saying this for a very long time. And it's about time people started listening to this guy. And he says attitudes in some other countries have already quickly changed. You know, since the, I was criticized in the general election uh, for talking about this too much, some people said. But in the course of the last six months, since that election, immigration and open borders is now the biggest issue amongst the British public by a country mile. Over 50% of people say it's their number one concern, almost double the number that even put the health service at the top of their list. So he's saying that in England, more than half the voting public, and you've got to realize a good chunk of that voting public actually is, is from the immigrant community. But he says more than half, and that's likely your traditional Englishman who's now worried that his culture is going to be fading away very, very quickly, is saying enough which is why I think that the government of David Cameron could fall into no confidence measure sometime soon, and this guy Farage could end up as the next prime minister of England, well, Great Britain, if you'd like to mention the entire country that they have. And then he was questioned from the audience. The fellow was concerned about 20,000 migrants coming to the Essex area. And Farage said, 20,000? Holy mackerel, where have you been? Don't worry about the 20,000. Worry about the 640,000 who came last year. Worry about the net increase of a third of a million, uh, plus the fact that many new migrants are very young and are having proportionately many more children. So that two in five primary schools, you know, next September, have a problem with class sizes and coping with the numbers. So let's not, let's not put the cart before the horse with this argument. Yeah, sure, if 20,000 extra people come over five years, they've got to be housed and looked after and all the rest of it. But frankly, that is irrelevant to the borderless Britain we're currently living in. You know, at some point in time, at some point in time, one of those countries like Greece is going to have an even deeper economic disaster than it's already had. Uh, and, and I have to say, if I was a young man living in Southern Europe at the moment, I would leave and come to London. You can't blame people for wanting to better their lives, but you have to balance that against the job of a British government, which is to put the interest of its own people first. And what's happening in this country? You've got President Obama and John Kerry saying, well, we'll have to take at least 100,000 of these people. What's the interest of the American people? Do they serve? Uh, is he the president of Syria? No, he's the president of the United States. Is John Kerry the secretary of state for Syria? No, he's the secretary of state for the United States. At some point, we've got to call their attention to the fact that government's main job is to protect its own people. Farage also answered a question yesterday while he was, or during this conference, this week, I should point out. He answered a question from someone about illegal immigration saying that that's even a separate issue that doesn't get addressed. In 1990, the population of Britain was 55 million. And actually, it was 55 million. The official population of Britain today is 64 million. But let, believe you me, it isn't 64 million. It's considerably higher than that because of illegal immigration, which we haven't even talked about this evening. That is a massive percentage change in 25 years in the population of a country. And if you have an open border, if you have absolutely no idea, if you really genuinely can't predict what your population is going to be, how the hell can you plan for hospitals, schools, for roads, or anything else? So, so actually, actually, it's just plain bad government, isn't it? Plain bad government, isn't it? That's what he says. You think about that for a moment. All the people who are pushing this in this area, we heard the figure the other day. It costs probably on average six or $7,000 to educate one student in Idaho per year. But the students of these parents coming here in this refugee program, it costs 300000 And if you weren't with us at the top of the show, I mentioned that the group that is opposed to this program, through FOIA, that's the Freedom of Information Act, they have received a rundown of where these, they don't have a total number on the expenses, but they've received a rundown on the expenses, and frankly, folks, we're being taken for a ride. 
Someone should acknowledge that. Someone should at least start respecting the people in this country who are doing all of the working and paying all the taxes. Wouldn't that be nice for a change? Bill Colley with you on Top Story. I've got more on this coming up. Uh, Rand Paul as well has some comments on it. Also, Dr. Ben Carson uh, still trying to point out uh, his, uh, his, uh, his comments uh, that he made last Sunday about a Muslim president. Not that it's, it's hypothetical, really. Not that it would ever happen, you would think. But he's still being, still being hit hard by people in media who don't seem to understand that Carson represents a huge number of Americans who are in absolute agreement with what he had to say when he was being questioned on NBC's Meet the Press last Sunday. Those things on the way in a few minutes. Also, we have a guest coming up in the next hour talking about a new Christian book she's written. That's on the way with Bill Colley on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com.